right, check out this bad boy. 12 megabytes of RAM, 500 megabyte hard drive, built-in spreadsheet capabilities, and a modem that transmits at over 28,000 BPS. Wow. What are you going to use it for? Games and stuff. <laughs> I always like this clip from Friends because I wonder what kind of games you could actually play on Chandler's computers these days. But it kind of reminds me that no matter how advanced computers get, if you are not using them for what they're designed for, you end up discrediting all the energy that went into designing computer architecture in the first place. And the story behind how the architecture came about is interesting in its own right. We're going to be looking at a new topic, CPU architecture, and today's session focuses on an understanding of the basic von Neumann model for a computer system and the stored program concept. Now this is a bit of revision for my GCSE because von Neumann is covered quite significantly there. However, there are slight changes and I'll highlight those as we go through. We're also going to be looking at developing an understanding of the purpose and role of registers, including the difference between general purpose and special purpose registers. So we're going to be paying close attention to MAR, MDR and all the other type of registers which are part of a CPU. Now as usual we're going to start off with some key terms so do feel free to pause the video and jot these down. So the most important one obviously is the von Neumann architecture. This is computer architecture which was introduced back in the 1940s and it itself introduced the concept of the stored program. Before that data and instructions were kept separate. Then you've got different components ALU or the arithmetic logic unit that deals with the arithmetic and logical operations in a CPU, the control unit which ensures synchronization of data flow and programs, then you've got the system clock which produces timing signals on the control bus to ensure synchronization takes place and think about what we were talking about last lesson with USB and asynchronous so we're going to be looking at synchronization and how the clock comes into play there. IAS which is the immediate access store, accumulator, general purpose register, which normally is useful with the arithmetic and logic unit. Of course, you need to know the definition of the register, which is a temporary component in the processor. And then you've got uh, the status register, which is used when an instruction requires some form of arithmetic or logical processing. Now, think of registers as kind of like a buffer. You've got the very slow primary memory and CPUs work really, really fast. So these special registers act as a buffer to ensure that they just don't idle around and wait for data. Next up is flag, which indicates the status of a bit in the status register. For example, n equals one indicates the result of an addition, gives a negative value. So you can have all of these little flags set up for various arithmetic operations. We're also going to be looking at the different types of buses, address bus, data bus and control bus. Some of these are unidirectional, that means data goes in one direction only. Others are bidirectional, which means data goes both ways. And the final key term is word, which is basically a group of bits used by a computer to represent a single unit. So we're going to be looking at that as well. So do pause the video and make sure that you get all these key terms down and more importantly, you understand what they mean. Okay, so let's delve into a bit of history about where this architecture came from and why we need computer architecture in the first place. We'll start off by talking about the think animal. Now the think animal is the name given by Einstein to von Neumann because he thought about a variety of disciplines and he made a significant impact in each one. From game theory in economics to DNA and AI to mathematics and things like merge sort and even working on the Manhattan Project which developed the first nuclear bomb in the 1940s, von Neumann was significantly involved in the science of that particular era. And what an era that was. There was war happening, you needed to decode enemy communication, there was the technology needed to develop the atomic bomb. All sorts of things were happening. There was the development of the transistor and computing power needed to be enhanced and increased. And that's where von Neumann came in. Einstein had a nickname for him and he used to call him Jansky as well instead of the think animal on the day-to-day -day basis. And here's a picture of all of them who worked around that era. And you'll probably see by reading the names that they are some of the topmost scientists of that particular era. 
Now, these people have had a significant impact on society and especially computer science. For example, we still use von Neumann's architecture and you're still learning about that. And it was discussed and debated in the 1940s. So you're thinking about close to 80 years old architecture, which still powers the computing devices that we use in this day and age. So quite a lot of genius and thinking has gone behind this and von Neumann is credited for doing most of the work. And you can find this work in a document called the first draft which described for the very first time the arithmetic logic unit, the control unit, the clock, the main memory, secondary storage and input and output manager. It built on Turing's work from 1936 which was called On Computable Numbers which introduced a stored program concept for the very first time but it developed it in a practical way and that practical way is still being used today and you can identify most of these components in today's devices. So what happened next was that people started a race to build a computer that conformed to the von Neumann architecture because before this data used to be kept separate from instructions and people had to use punch cards and you have to feed the instructions in and then you have to feed the data and it used to take a lot of time. In June 1948, Freddie Williams, Tom Kilburn and Jeff Tutil from the University of Manchester built the first stored program concept computer using a combination of valves and transistors. It was a bit of a hybrid of older technology and newer technology. Neumann built his one in 1951. So they cut some corners and they used valves instead of transistors all throughout. Now the original design for the Manchester baby is on screen and it is strikingly similar to the designs of today's processor architecture. So it, it's got the main store, it's got the processor, it's got the instruction addresses and the rest. If you look at the official version of the von Neumann architecture, you'll identify some of the main features which include a CPU, a processor which is able to access the memory directly, you will have computer memories that could store programs as well as data, which is called the stored program concept. And stored programs made up of instructions that could be executed in a sequential order. Now the main components of the processor are the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, the control unit, which is CU, the system clock, and the immediate access store. The diagram that you see on screen, do pause the video and do try to jot this down because this is the one that you need to retain for AS level. It's pretty similar to the one you must have encountered at IGCSE, but you've got a couple of additional bits like the system clock, which are part of the diagram, which weren't there before. And then you've also got something called the status registers, which link to the arithmetic and logic unit because they help with the arithmetic side of things. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. So let's delve into the ALU. And the ALU allows the required arithmetic or logic operations to be carried out while a program is being run. And it's possible for a computer to have more than one arithmetic logic unit. One, for example, could perform fixed point operations and other floating point operations. And we're going to be looking at floating points a bit more at A2 level in year 13. The accumulator is a temporary register used when carrying out ALU calculations and it stores perhaps the intermediate steps the calculation. Multiplication and division are carried out by a sequence of addition, subtraction and left and right shifting operations. For example, shifting 00110111 two places to the left gives us 11011100, which is the equivalent to multiplying by a factor of 4. You might want to work this out by decoding it and seeing what the Dean values are by pausing the video. So this is particular the left shift and if you wanted to do a right shift see what happens when you move things two digits to the right do you end up dividing by a factor of four I'll let you find that out now the arithmetic logic unit is highlighted with the accumulator because it uses that as the main store however status registers come into play here as well and we'll talk a bit more about them later on next up is the control unit the control unit reads an instruction from memory. The address of the location where the instruction can be found is normally stored in the program counter. Now this instruction is then interpreted and during that process signals are generated along the control bus to tell all the other components in the computer what to do. The CU 
ensures synchronization of data flow and program instructions throughout the computer. At IGCSE, you're normally told that the control unit is the brains of the computer, and that's true in a way because without the control unit, we can't decode what an instruction is supposed to do, and you can't do the arithmetic required, and then none of the wonderful stuff that we see on computers would actually happen. Now, there are other key components that work with the control unit, and the system clock is perhaps the most key. It's used to produce timing signals on the control bus to ensure this vital synchronization takes place. Without the clock, the computer would simply crash, so it is key. Of course, there is the immediate access stores, and the IS holds all the data and programs that the processor needs to access. The CPU then takes data and programs held in backing store and puts them into the IAS temporarily. So it is another name for RAM or primary memory. Now this is done because the read-write operation carried out using the IAS are considerably faster than read-write operations to the backing store or secondary storage. Consequently, any key data needed by an application will be stored temporarily in the IAS to speed up operations. But as we found out, the IAS isn't fast enough and registers come into play later on as well. One of the most fundamental components of the von Neumann system is the register. And registers can be both general purpose or special purpose. General purpose registers hold data that is frequently used by the CPU or it can be used by the programmer when addressing the CPU directly. The accumulator, for example, is a general purpose register. There are, of course, special purpose registers and they have specific functions within the CPU. They hold the program state at a particular point in time. So do pause the video and have a look at the table which identifies a few registers that are commonly used within the von Neumann architecture. You need to be aware of the current instruction register, which stores the current instruction being decoded and executed. The index register, which is used to carry out index addressing operations, especially when you're using assembly code. The memory address register and the memory data buffer register. The memory address register stores the address of the memory location and the data register or the buffer register stores data which has just been read from the memory or data which is about to be written to memory. Then, of course, you've got the program counter, which stores the address where the next instruction to be read can be found. And then, finally, you have the status register, which is a special register which contains bits, which can be set or cleared depending on the operation. For example, to indicate overflow in a calculation. So these status registers can be used for a variety of purposes and can be specific to a type of operation, like detecting overflow. So let's look at a status register use case example. Index registers are best explained when looking at addressing techniques in assembly code. And we're going to be looking at that a bit more later on in the unit. Now they identify the location of data and how it should be loaded up. A status register, on the other hand, is a special register which is used when an instruction requires some form of arithmetic or logic processing. Each bit in a status register is a flag. Most systems have the following four flags. You will have a carry flag, C, which is set to one if there is a carry following an addition operation. You can refer back to the first section where you will find all of this. Then you've got a negative flag, N, which is set to one if the result of a calculation yields a negative value. You obviously have the overflow flag, V, which is set to one if an arithmetic operation results in an overflow being produced. And finally, you've got a zero flag, Z, which is set to one if the result of an arithmetic or logic operation is zero. Now, all of these status register flags can help avoid errors because these can be checked before that result is used in another calculation. So let's have a look at this particular arithmetic operation. You've got two binary numbers which need to be added. So the flags currently are set to N, V, C, Z as 1, 1, Zero, zero. Since we have two positive numbers being added, the answer should not be a negative. However, if you work this operation out, you will see that we end up with one in the first column, which can identify a negative value. The flag indicates two errors, a negative result and an overflow occurrence. Now consider this operation. When you add 1000, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 1100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you end up with the following flags, N, V, C, Z, 
stand as 0, 1, 1, 0. So V indicates overflow and C indicates a carry has been generated. And that results in a 9th bit overflow. Other flags can be generated such as a parity flag, an interrupt flag or a half carry flag. And all of these help in detecting errors in arithmetic calculations and the CPU can do something about it. Now system buses are a common way to transmit data throughout the architecture. These buses are used in computers as a parallel transmission component. Each wire in the bus transmits one bit of data. There are three common buses used in the von Neumann architecture and if you study these at IGCSE you know that they are called the address bus, data bus and control bus. The address bus as the name suggests carries addresses throughout the computer system between the CPU and the memory. The address bus is unidirectional. It works in one directional only, so CPU to the memory location. This prevents addresses being carried back to the CPU, which would be undesirable. The width of a bus is important, so the wider the bus, the more memory locations which can be directly addressed at any given time. For example, if you have a bus width of 16 bits, you can address 2 to the power of 16, which is about 65,000 different memory locations. And if you have a bus with a width of 32 bits, 2 to the power of 32, it allows almost 4 billion plus memory locations to be simultaneously addressed. Even this isn't large enough these days. Modern computers go 64-bit and even 128-bit buses are often needed to access the amount of memory we have these days, especially in supercomputers. Now the data bus is a bidirectional bus. In other words, it allows data to be sent in both directions along the bus. This means data can be carried from CPU to memory and vice versa. It also means that you can send data to and from input and output devices. So it's important to point out that data can be an address, an instruction or a numerical value. As with the address bus, the width of the data bus is important. The wider the bus, the larger the word length that can be transported. A word is a group of bits which can be regarded as a single unit, for example 16-bit or 32-bit. 64-bit word lengths are the most common these days. Larger word lengths can improve the computer's overall performance because you're sending data in huge chunks and modern CPUs can deal with that. And finally you've got the control bus which is also bidirectional. It carries signals from the control unit to all the other computer components. It's usually 8 bits wide since it only carries control signals, so there's no need for a wider bandwidth. Now, the von Neumann bottleneck has been a big problem, and it wasn't an issue in the earlier days when computer processors were very, very slow. However, as they became faster and faster, it's created this bottleneck. Valve computers themselves were slow, but with transistors, CPUs now have to wait for instructions or data. The fetch part of the cycle takes a lot longer than decoding or executing. Harvard architecture solved that by splitting memory into two parts, one for instruction and the other for data. And modern computers combine both von Neumann and Harvard ideas in a hybrid architecture to maximize performance. Now if you divide instructions and data, so RAM can be divided into two chunks, one that just holds instructions and one that just holds data, things can be a lot more faster. Now, despite the name Harvard Architecture, Harvard Architecture was also designed by von Neumann, so he's everywhere. That's it for today though. By now, you should have understood what the main features of a von Neumann architecture are. You should be able to describe the three buses. You should also be able to explain why it is important to have a wider bit length in a bus and what the purpose is of status registers. That's all for today. As usual, if you do have any questions, reach out to me and I will see you in the next lesson.